You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have Richard Gallo, MD, PhD. He's a leading medical scientist in the fields of human immunology, skin biology, and the microbiome. I received postgraduate training at Harvard and is now a distinguished professor and founding chairman of the Department of Dermatology at University of California, San Diego. So we're going to be talking about uh, some of his research and work. So, Rich, from one Rich to another, welcome. Oh, thank you very much, Rich. Yeah. Well, if you would uh, tell me about uh, what got you interested in dermatology and immunology and the the work that you do. Well, uh, you know, it's really a a question about how does uh, the host protect itself. Um, Immunology classically is the study of of, really immune systems, how we learn or adapt to resist infections. That can be a, a human being infected by a microbe or a plant infected by a microbe. And the skin is uh, the, sort of the first layer between the inside and out. So they go together very logically. Okay. And what's your current research involved? Uh, we, we've become very interested over the last decade in um, better understanding what the microbes that our skin tolerates are doing to benefit us. Uh, mm. Previously, we, you know, I, 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 much like yourself, thought about the bugs on our skin as something that we needed to protect ourselves from and that they were generally negative. And we learned about a, a number of natural antibiotics that skin produces that can kill many bacteria and are essential for preventing infection. But it became more and more obvious that um, there are a, a number of very specific species of bacteria that always show up on the skin despite the fact that we have immune systems that are trying to protect against them. And it dawned on us that maybe this isn't an accident, maybe this is by evolutionary design. And uh, we think that's true, and uh, we've been learning a lot about how bacteria can help us now. So um, you look at it as the body tolerating these microbes, or do you look at it as the body and the microbes both being necessary constituents of the skin niche? Yeah, the, the latter. We re- I really there's a there's a theory known as the hologenome, which says that the the genetic the genetic elements of both the the human part that's inherited from your mother and father, combined with the ge- genetic elements of microbes in the environment, and that combined system is what makes up the human body. So um, it's funny. I guess I, when I think about our microbiome, you know, people always talk about the gut microbiome. But it appears that there's a microbiome in every single part of our body. I don't know if that's your experience or if there's direct literature on that, but certainly we have yeah, a skin microbiome. Yeah, there's a lot of literature regarding uh, bacteria that are present, usually at epithelial surfaces. So, you know, we don't think there's a very much of a microbiome, say, in the heart or the liver. Or, but, you know, we could even be wrong there. It just would be very rare microbes. In, in, in the colon and in the, you know, intestine, and of course, in feces, there's a lot of microbes. Um, and on the skin, there's perhaps even more microbes, and they they are in very, very close contact with the body. They're not sort of in a tube moving through, but they reside 
within the follicles and pores of the skin and are constantly there and communicating with us. Well, what's interesting is if you consider the microbiome, you know, in a deep place in the body, it's not exposed to a lot of outside material as much as something that's deep within the body. The skin will be exposed to not only a lot of outside material, but a lot of inorganic material. So I would think it would have to be of a very different nature than a microbiome, let's say in our gut or other parts of our body. Yeah, so, so in the gut, of course, everything you swallow goes through there, so there's a, there's a special exposure. On the skin, uh, and that, that's one of the fundamental issues of the microbiome today is distinguishing between microbes that are sort of transient resonance. You know, if you swallow something uh, with, with a certain uh, bunch of microbes, you'll find that DNA in the stool later on. That doesn't mean that that's part of the community that's designed to work specifically with human health. And same as on the skin. If you touch something that's, you know, contaminated with certain organisms, you'll find them on the skin for some transient period of time. What's unique is that the, in each of these follicles, there's a very specific anatomy that um, once microbes enter these little pores a couple millimeters deep on the skin, they're then somewhat trapped and nurtured in there and kept in check by the immune system so they don't become an infection, but also very, very difficult to remove. So there's been a number of uh, studies by uh, our group and others looking at common hand washing techniques, topical disinfectants, and so forth. And what you see is that they can be good at getting rid of the bacteria on the surface, but they don't change the skin microbiome. They don't get down in those pores and, and change that to any significant degree. Well, um, is there a thought that um, too much hand washing or using those antibacterial gels causes a dysbiosis in the local skin microbiome or hands? There was a fear about that um, 10 years ago when we first discovered some of the very important functions of the skin microbiome. That was a question that a number of us had, and um, it turns out that um, our, our, you know, we've evolved a way, since these bugs are so important, to do a pretty good job of, of protecting them. So if you, if you do too much hand washing, you'll eventually wind up damaging the skin itself, and when the skin is damaged, then the microbiome becomes abnormal or, or dysbiosis. Um, but the... the a gentle uh, washing, a common washing techniques that don't cause you to have a rash, do not do a lot for changing that deep skin microbiome. So it has a natural resiliency to change, is what it sounds like. Yeah, a very, very much, and I and we believe it to be uh, an evolutionary essential aspect of human health that we've designed a, a, a way to make that skin microbiome resilient. Yeah, it makes sense. How, how localized are the different niches in the skin? Is it like follicle to follicle? You'll see different niches, or is it um, over a wider area? You know, I know, I'm sure it depends on what part of the body you're talking about. But what's been yeah, it, it seems, it, you know, the, the limited work that's been done is that it's more body environment dependent rather than follicle dependent. So, uh, you know, an armpit's going to be different than a forehead. But, um, you know, in small, by, in small areas within an arm, the different parts of the arm are pretty much the same. Yeah, that's what I wondered. I, you know, I've always wondered, um, has anyone swabbed their left armpit and their right armpit and seen how much of a difference there is in the microbiome, for instance? Do we see any of that going on? Uh, well, we've done those studies of not the armpit, but the forearm. And... Um, Within an individual, the uh, sort of base composition seems to be pretty similar. So, you know, uh, you have 10 parts of species A and five parts of species B, et cetera, et cetera. But um, people that uh, have disease and are abnormally colonized then by another microbe, and for the skin, the big one we, we see a lot is Staph aureus. Mm -hmm. um, that can be very different on the left versus the right arm. But in a healthy person, would it was it very different when they looked at the forearm test? Did they no, that just no they're healthy people? fairly similar, fairly similar. Not exactly the same, but similar. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering. I, I guess um, I imagine a healthy microbiome, whatever niche it's in, doesn't just have one particular solution. 
you know, meaning 10 parts of this and five parts of that. But it seems like there's variations on a theme that are still considered healthy, especially like within the gut. But I guess that's what makes it hard. I, I'm sure that varies person to person and it probably varies in the same person under different conditions. But again, there's several, at least multiple different stationary uh, healthy mixes of microbes. I don't know how much they vary, but I wonder if that's been evaluated. Yeah, it's 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 being looked at more and more, and um, there's a lot more diversity of the cells of the microbial community than there is in the human body. But you know, if you look at the immu- human immune systems, you you will have a different number of lymphocytes in your blood right now than I do, but within a range of normal. And that range is just even more broad for the cells of the microbial community in your body. Yeah, I guess we would have to characterize enough people's, you know, healthy microbiome, let's say in the skin, and then we would really know what does dysbiosis look like? Because, I mean, if you don't know how much variation there is, it would be hard to characterize, okay, this is dysbiosis, because I guess it would be, um, it just wouldn't be a clear signal. Exactly. What's normal for you might not be normal for someone else. Well, what's the learning in that regard? Like how much has been characterized and are we starting to understand what dysbiosis looks like and what the consequences are? Uh, Yes to both your questions. Um, We're learning in a couple different ways. One is we're learning by assigning uh, more specific tags to different types of bacteria. So, you know, we've focused a lot on taxa divided by species. You know, one type of bacterial species may have one name versus another. And right. to give you an example, in, in, on skin, we have something called Staph aureus, and we, which is usually a pathogen. We have something called Staph epidermidis, which is usually a commensal, you know, present on the skin. But what we've learned is that not everybody's Staph epidermidis is the same. You can have many different kinds of Staph epidermidises, and some of the Staph epis may have genes that are detrimental to patients, whereas some others may be beneficial. So this characterization of the microbial community really comes down to characterization of the genes in the microbes and understanding exactly what the different genes are doing in these different scenarios. Well, because at the bacterial level, these bacteria are actively trading gene fragments and genes in order to continue adaptation? Exactly. And they're producing toxins that uh, might give them a, se- a selective survival advantage, but that toxin at the same time damages the host, or they may produce a protein that gives them a selective advantage that also benefits the host and further exacerbates their advantage over some of the toxin producing. So it's a big game of cat and mouse. Different genes may help us. Different genes may hurt us. All the microbes can care about is is survival and protecting that niche. Is there an apparent uh, hierarchy whereby the microbes interact with each other in one way and they interact with our, you know, the host cells, I guess you can call them in a different way? And even amongst yeah. the bacteria, uh, is there an apparent hierarchy or it can't be known? Yeah, well, I, I, I think uh, the way I'm thinking about a hierarchy of one more important than the other, I would say no. I think it's very much an interdependent network where um, if, you, if you pull one aspect of the spider web, the whole thing changes, um, and everybody's dependent on everyone else. Well, how do you characterize the given bacteria? Because it sounds like the genes it has, the genes it expresses, the metabolites it makes, et cetera, are all context-dependent on what's around it, what's interacting with it. Well, we, we, we use a combination of methods. First, um, genomically, understanding if the DNA is present, so that really tells you if the if the strain of bacteria that could make that product exists. Um, then we can look at the RNA produced. That says if it's transcribed. We look at the protein itself in the case when they are a protein by antibody mediated methods by uh, antibodies, and then ultimately you could, we, we're doing clinical trials in the presence and absence of those products to see in the context of the human body, what is the effect of those, those products on, on human health. Yeah, it just seems uh, really complicated to figure that out. Yeah, it's somewhat complicated, but it actually, we, we found out some of the some most basic fundamental principles 
are fairly logical. So take, for example, we a few years ago found that a number of the bacteria that are associated with health make antibiotics themselves that kill off Staph aureus. And people who were colonized by the bacteria that produced those antibiotics weren't colonized by Staph aureus. Um, And then you look at a group of people like people with eczema, they have a hard time allowing those bacteria to survive. And we did a trial where we just took a bacteria that makes that antibiotic against Staph aureus and put that bacteria on people and it was fantastically effective, actually much more so than antibiotics, pharmaceutical antibiotic. And adding that member to the microbiome not only killed off the Staph aureus, but allowed the other microbes that were being suppressed by Staph aureus to bloom. So it promoted diversity as well. So, yeah, I mean, Brunt's, I understand why that would work much better than Brunt's spectrum. I mean, it it makes total sense. Um, What do you think is going to be necessary for personalized medicine? Do you think it's going to be a... People will have to have, let's say, for instance, all their microbiomes evaluated when they're healthy so that when they fall sick, you can see the difference? Or do you think it'll be enough to have a uh, representative population that's sampled and then that'll apply to most cases when there's a, a problem? Yeah, I think it's, it's going to be, it, I think both will be true and we can take our lead from what we've observed in, in human medicine over the last century. So in infectious diseases, you know, we, we know that Many common infectious diseases are caused by types of organisms that are killed by certain common antibiotics. So you go to the doctor with an, an ear infection, and he may give you an antibiotic, or she may give you an antibiotic without really knowing exactly what bug is in your ear, but with the experience that it usually works. And, and that can be true. Uh, and on the other hand, take cancer chemotherapy, where Seeing cancers are caused by many different genetic mutations and host problems, and there's not necessarily one chemical that everybody who has a cancer will work, it will work for. So in that situation, you need much more personalized medicine. I think the microbiome is just the exact same thing. In some diseases, one particular microbe may be the perfect solution for 90% of the individuals, where in others it requires personalized analysis. Hmm. Um. Yeah, I'm just trying to get my head around this. So for a given population, you know, they, they all have this inherent stability to being disturbed, like you mentioned, you know, with hand washing, let's say. Um, what, for instance, creates that stability? You know, I, I would think, like, again, adversarial conditions would kill off microbes in a population, but perhaps it selectively kills off ones that aren't important for the stability of the population. I mean, it, you know, if a population is stable in a good way, wonderful. But if a population is dysbiotic and it's stable in a, in a dysbiotic way, how do you get it back to a healthy state so that it's stable again and healthy and not just yeah, transient? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we know some some of that in, in with humans. So the um, uh, situation of people with inflammatory skin diseases, they will have skin inflammation and a dysbiotic community. You can treat them. You can treat the human immune system with a drug that normalizes it causes less inflammation. And then that correction of the human skin environment permits the microbiome to correct. And then you could do the opposite experiment. You could attack the microbiome and show that as you improve the microbiome, that permits the human environment to, to correct. So they're very much interrelated. That's why I say, you know, I, I don't like to think about a hierarchy, but really a network. So maybe another type of therapy will be a nudge from both sides. Maybe you can't, maybe a certain condition couldn't be treated one way or the other, but would it have to be treated both ways from the inside and outside because to do it only one way would be, uh, wouldn't create stability or would really hurt the person, for instance. So I guess yeah. it, it leaves a third way to treat people. Yeah. And we do that, you know, we're trying to do that kind of thing with people now. So you know, you have dry skin, you use a moisturizer, and you have dry skin that's infected by uh, Staph aureus, you might use a moisturizer with an antibiotic, but the antibiotics aren't all that effective, so maybe a better way would be to use a moisturizer and a sort of microbiome-derived approach to, to improving the, micro, the uh, bad bugs. Well, what do you see from um, modern medicine and even other scientists? Are they open to these 
different approaches, or are they still fixated on the broad spectrum or small molecule drug type approaches? Well, in medicine, your first responsibility is to do what you know is going to work for your patient now. You know, that's really when I see patients, that's the first thing I think of. So the big, ex- the big, the big current experience now is that, you know, tried and true antibiotics work in some situations. And until we have more experience with other methods, that's going to be the first choice. Unfortunately, in the microbiome probiotic world, there have been a lot of exaggerated claims. So we're going to have to work past some of the exaggerations to kind of weed out the, the truth from, uh, from things that maybe are not so true. I, I think and in the future, we, it's great. It's, you know, it's, we're, we're, this is going to be something that definitely will be applied in medicine, but it's taking a while. Well, yeah, I've heard some of the barriers are this, the time it takes to do a sequencing of the microbiome of a given area, you know, beyond like the 16S, like the true shotgun, or, and then to look at yeah. metabolomics or proteomics or any of that is even more, and then the cost. So I, I guess I would hope that as the speed increases and the cost comes down of doing those things, then uh, it'll be much easier to have more specific approaches instead of broad spectrum type, you know, remedies. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, that's that's for the very detailed description. But you go to your doctor; he doesn't, she doesn't necessarily uh, do a whole genome sequence on you to to find out, you know, what's wrong with you. They they make a clinical diagnosis and then they apply a therapy. And I think the biggest progress that we're seeing in the microbiome world right now is that we know enough to start making hypotheses where we can say, let's apply this bug. Let's use this approach for C. diff infections and diarrhea. Let's use this approach for atopic dermatitis on the skin or for, for acne. It's a microbiome therapeutic, and the, the, the effectiveness of that is going to give us much more progress than simply uh, doing more and more uh, descriptive work without understanding what, what the importance of what you're describing is. Yeah, I agree. Well, what would be an ideal scenario that you envision in the future? Someone, um, like two scenarios, you know, someone has a dire disease, like they have, uh, you know, I don't know, melanoma, melanoma um, right. versus someone that just has eczema. What would be right. like, the ideal way to approach both that you envision in the future? Um, well, with, you know, with the really life-threatening diseases, it would be very helpful to understand what the relative contribution of the microbiome is to that. So, for example, if it, it, in melanomas, maybe a good example where some microbes in the intestinal system can help uh, or hinder the absorption of drugs that are treating the, the melanoma. So if you treat the individual in a way that's going to make the drug against the melanoma work the best, that's an effective and logical way to exploit melanoma for that particular disease. And there's examples of that being developed. With atopic dermatitis, there's severe complications from some of the therapies that we're currently using, steroids and so forth. And the microbiome looks like a way where you can completely avoid the, uh, the complications of uh, current approaches, which have limited efficacy, but and, and instead sort of use the systems that should be in place. And then our dream really is can you identify individuals early in life that perhaps were colonized by microbes that aren't helping them maintain health and make a change early in life so that it becomes permanent and uh, they have the optimal health-benefiting effects of the microbiome, be it on the skin or in the intestine? Makes sense. Do, have you observed with um, skin conditions that it, it, the problem initiates from inside or outside? You know, is it an outside insult or environment that's causing a lot of these conditions, or is it coming from the inside and not weeping out through the skin? But um, again, what causes it is coming from inside and it's just showing up on the skin. Yeah, the, the most of the common skin diseases, when you look at a population as a whole, some of the people are much more. It's the human gene that's predicting it, so you could say that's an inside out. And some of the people, they develop the disease because of their environmental exposure and perhaps because of the dysbiotic microbiome. So in that case, you could call it an outside in. I just didn't know if predominantly you saw one or the other or if you you can't tell. 
you can't tell. There have been twin studies to look at that in many skin diseases, and you can't just look at somebody and say for sure, oh, this was, well, in some diseases you can, but in, in most of them you can't say this is caused by something you're exposed to versus a genetic predisposition to that. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Any, um, you know, I guess I'm poking around and asking all these questions. But I don't know, what have you been learning that really surprises you or excites you or, you know, in your own research? Anything new that's that's come out that really has, like, changed your perspective? Yeah, well, I, you know, we started this interview, you know, talking about why I became a dermatologist and was interested in immune defense in the skin. And what we're, I think, very excited about now is, at least in, in animal experimental models, we can affect atherosclerosis, we can affect colitis, we can affect other organ systems by doing things in the skin specifically. So uh, the sort of the arbitrary divides between different organs, I think, are starting to fall away and we realize you got to treat the whole patient. And in this case, the whole patient includes the cells of the human body as well as the microbes that survive on it. That's great. Wow. Huh. So uh, in terms of colitis, these other conditions, would that look like perhaps a skin cream that has certain microbes in it uh, that then gets absorbed and goes into the body and affects change even to the inner tissues? Yeah. I mean, what we're doing is that it's the microbes that are doing something to the skin. The skin then releases something from the skin that circulates and then is detected by the cells in the colon. Huh. Yeah. Well, all right. Here's, here's, I guess, an interesting question I've asked a lot. Um, what kind of communication do you see going on bacteria to bacteria within a niche, but then what kind of communication do you see bacteria to host cells in a given niche? Do you think there is any, yeah. and is it a complex nature? Like, you know, is there a big trading of resources? Like, what, what do you think is going on? Yeah, so we, we just had a paper on that, so it's great that you ask it. Uh, you know, bacteria communicate each to each other through something called quorum sensing. And uh, we've identified, and our colleagues have shown, specific chemicals that will come from one bacteria to another bacteria, even across species. Um, and that results in the other bacteria then maybe producing or not producing a, a, yet a third molecule that's detected by the host. And then the human body detects that molecule, produces its own things, which feeds back on, you know, bacteria number one. So that's a simple, like, one, two, three connection, but the reality of it is you've got, you know, uh, uh, several hundred, in the case of the skin, different microbes, sending these different peptides across to each other, detecting them, then producing other things that the body's producing, and then feeding back into the microbes. So it's really, really interesting, and this, we're starting to put our finger on exactly what the molecular structure of those molecules are and how they're working. But think about that. What does that tell you about the sophistication of a given bacteria? It has to know self. It has to know community of self. It has to know other. And it has to know other, other, and its place within this community. And, you know, yeah, it could be selfish and want what it wants. You know, again, I'm anthropomorphizing. But, I mean, it, it just tells me that bacteria are much more sophisticated, perhaps, than we thought. And this cell-to-cell -cell communication where this communication extends beyond human cells. It sells to bacteria and back and forth. And I mean, what does that tell you? Am I wrong here? No, you're exactly right. You've got, you put your finger right on it. And it, it, it tells us that this is a, you know, this is a highly evolved community. The organisms evolved over the millennia with the human body. We made the mistake of thinking about bacteria as these, sing, these simple single cell organisms that are evolutionarily ancient, but the reality of it is these are cells within complex communities that have co-evolved with us over the millennia. Um, so, you know, some of these gene products, like I'm talking about, communicate the single product when the same species sees it, that species reacts in a positive way, but that product also evolves so that if a different species sees it, that species quiets down and stops surviving as well. So the, mm. the, the bacteria made one gene product that has dual functions. That's much more beneficial than a different gene doing two different things. Um, and, it, you know, that's, that's the product of a lot of trial and, ever, uh, and, uh, trial and error and uh, evolutionary selection. Yeah, and 
I know you, you don't believe that there's a hierarchy, but for instance, if, uh, you know, if I took a course of antibiotics, I may kill off, you know, a large part or maybe all my gut bacteria, for instance, but I'm still alive. And then that gut bacteria will repopulate and the components probably will be different. So it just seems like, I don't know, if I take my somatic cells, they're of a, a more protected class, a, uh, a more important, they have more of an importance to me than my constituent bacteria, although both are important. That's why I say it seems like there is perhaps a, a hierarchy. I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah. That? So, I mean, actually, when, when you give antibiotics and, and it, many antibiotics and you alter the bacteria population, that certainly occurs in the gut very easily. But when you stop the antibiotics, most people with most antibiotics return to their prior condition. So it doesn't randomly repopulate. Um, well, and if it randomly, doesn't randomly but, it, but in some cases, I mean, people's guts have been disturbed for months or years after a course of antibiotics. But the organism as a whole is still alive. The person is still alive. They're not dead, even though their whole bacterial host may be dead for a period of time and then replaced. Yeah, yeah. And and, um, the person isn't dead, but they might not function as well, right? Right. Uh, And if you're in a car accident, you can lose your spleen. And, uh, you know, you don't really miss it, but you don't quite function as well. There's certain types of infections that you're a little bit more uh, susceptible to. So... Um, the, the, there's a lot of redundancy in, uh, in immunology, and uh, so I think there are redundant systems to maintain health, but optimal health is the whole communities working together. Mm. Yeah, I just wonder where is that? It's weird. Like We're, we're a, a combination of hundreds of different cell types, you know, trillions of cells, but also bacteria, fungi, yeast, viruses, et cetera. But yet we, are, we feel like we're one creature. But we're composed right. of so many different things. It's just, it's odd. And I don't know how to reconcile that in, in my head or if that ever occurs to you, but it's just an odd thing to think, you know? Why is there a feeling like you are you, but yet you are so many different things at the same time, you know? Yeah, it's it's hard It's because your personal experience, of course, isn't to see the these microbes and what they're doing for you. And I guess at one point, you know, most people's personal experience wasn't to think about blood circulating and delivering oxygen to the brain and so forth. So it's really what you're, what you're, you know, used to thinking about. And in, in some of my lectures, I like to show pictures of, I don't know if you've seen the picture of sort of the clownfish and the sea anemone, where the, the, the fish are kind of living in the poisonous anemone, but they don't get stung by it. And that's mm-hmm. a, that protects them. And it's very obvious there, there's two species that are cohabitating in a symbiotic relationship and each is benefiting each other because you can see them with us. We can't see these microbes. So it's not as obvious to us, but there's also no, there's no, like uh, there's no creature that is both clownfish and sea anemone that calls itself something and has those two constituent elements. Like there's no, there's no living thing that says I am the ocean, for instance, and yeah. I have all these things in me, but I feel like I am, you know, I know we're getting metaphysical, but it's just, yeah. A quick question that came to mind. That's why I asked. Yeah. A, a single sentence thing. Going, yeah, so. we, we don't know. We, I mean, you know, there's a lot of people who believe that uh, mental functions, uh, depression, uh, other neurological aspects, memory, are also influenced by the microbiome. We're just not aware of it. Mm. So, uh, you know, so getting back to your research, what, what do you think is going to be possible in the next couple of years? Any uh, breakthroughs that you think are imminent that you can talk about? Yeah, you know, I think there'll be actually FDA-approved drugs, uh, specifically using what we've learned about the microbiome so, so far to affect disease. Um, and uh, it's the, the sky's the limit um, in terms of which diseases can be treated. The, the low-hanging fruit, as I like to say for that, are the diseases where we're using one microbe to battle another microbe. So there's the example of fecal transplantation for C. difficile infection, and then there's the example atopic dermatitis and staph aureus. Uh, in both cases, the microbiome showing it's effective in treating the, the pathogens involved in those diseases. But I think we're going to learn there's other things that maybe weren't so obvious that the microbiome can treat as well. Okay. Well, very good. Um, what's the best way for folks to read your papers, find out more specifically about what you're doing, and maybe get in contact? Yeah, uh, I'm on. I have a website. My laboratory uh, lists a lot of the publications, and then uh, by email is a, is a, 
way I tend to communicate best. Okay. Any last things uh, I should have asked that I left out, or you think we covered a lot? No, you, you asked good questions. Thank you. Oh, good. Well, Rich, thank <laughs> you for coming. I, I really appreciate it. Okay, Rich. Be well. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Thank you.